Imagine two people going to a movie during an era when you had to stand in the queue to buy tickets. The ticket counter has a very long line and once you enter it, there is no way to turn back. You must get the ticket and exit from the queue from the other side. Today, two of my friends are heading to the theater. Let's call them D1 and D2, Donnie and Dan. Dan, being punctual, arrived early and joined the queue. A few people got in the queue after that. Then Donnie or D2 came and joined the queue. Who do you think should get the first ticket? Assuming Donnie is not a close friend of the theater manager, I think it should be the first guy, Dan, who got into the queue first. And indeed it is. Dan gets out first with the ticket. The other people in the queue also got their tickets at their turn. And then eventually D2 or Donnie got her ticket too. Well, next week I'm planning to watch a movie at the theater. Although I trust my friends Dan and Donnie's account that the queue was fair and they obtained the tickets as expected, I still want to verify it myself using formal methods, of course. Before I tell you how I'm going to do it, let me invite you to check out my YouTube channel, Formal Intelligence, where I post regular fun videos on formal verification. Please consider subscribing to the channel if you find this content useful. Now, let's get back to the original question. <clears throat> Is the queue fair? If I can ensure this condition, which you see on the screen, for any random person D1 and D2, I think we can say with some confidence that the queue was fair. So D1, any random D1 gets into the queue, another person D2 gets, gets into the queue later, and D1 is still in the queue, that should imply that D2 should also be in the queue. <clears throat> we are indirectly trying to say that D2 shouldn't come out before D1. Formal engineers routinely verify FIFO or first in first out designs. While it may seem very straightforward to experienced engineers, beginners fi might find it less obvious. In this explanation, I'll provide a simple overview of FIFO verification without delving into the code. The FIFO design is similar to the, or rather a hardware equivalent of the queue at the movie theater. I'm Vinish. On my channel, I regu share regular content on formal verification. In this video, I'll guide you through the process of verifying FIFO. FIFO looks like this. In fact, this is a very simplified representation. It has a read and write port. Uh, it has read and write data input port um, and read and write enables. So this is also an input it's shown as output by mistake. So you can read something when uh, the read signal is asserted and write something into it when the write signal is asserted. And data in is usually a multi-bit signal, uh, which is the actual data that you're going to store in the FIFO. Consider this read and write enables as something similar to the doors into the queue at the movie theater, into out of the queue and into the queue will be equal to read and write enables. So this is a queue that we discussed earlier and the check that we talked about for the queue at the movie theater. So our goal is to implement this for the FIFO. First, we assign a signal D1 underscore in that would go high when a particular data D in, which is equal to D1 gets written into the FIFO. This will set, uh, this is a combinational assignment. It immediately happens. And at the positive at the clock, when this D1 in, which is assigned here is set, then it will set a sticky flag or kind of a level signal. By that, what I mean is, it's, it's something that gets asserted and stays there forever, unless uh, we are going, we are resetting the design, until we are resetting the design. So, D1 is in is going to be a small pulse when this condition is uh, true and then sampled in D1 is going to be a level signal from the next cycle onwards. We have similar signals for D2 as well, which would come here 
I'm not going to explain that to reduce the clutter. And we will have, so that that's the part where D1 gets in and D2 gets in. Now comes the part where D1 and D2 gets out. How do we model that? So we have another signal called D1 out, which gets assigned, which gets asserted when we have this condition set. So we have a read happening in the 5.4 and there is a D out coming out and the value happens to be equal to D1, which we sampled in. And then we have the sticky flag sampled in D1 set. That means somewhere in the past, we sampled D1 into the 5.4. We are not interested in other cases where D out might be equal to D1. And similar to this sticky flag D1, sampled D1 in, we have something called sampled D out in, which again gets set we have when we have D1 out is set. So in short, D1 out is, a, is going to be a pulse, can be a pulse, which will get set when we have D out equal to D1 after uh, we sampled uh, a value dn equal to d1 somewhere in the past and this d1 out it will set a sticky flag called sampled out d1 and similarly we will have d2 out and sampled out d2 here which i'm not going to show again now what's what's our check we, we know this from the previous explanation and if we just translate that to a check in system Verilog, you get this. D1 got into the queue, that means sampled in D1. D2 got into the queue, that means sampled in D2. D1 is still in the queue, that means sampled out D1 is low because D, this condition has never happened. That should imply that D2 is still in the queue, that means sampled out D2 should also be low. Is that everything that we need to verify a FIFO? It might work for some static uh, uh, D1 and D2, some fixed values. What if there is a bug uh, for a different D1 and D2? To address these kind of scenarios, we have something called symbolic variables in formal, where it's uh, if you don't know anything about symbolic variables, consider it as a, an internal FE signal, just an F signal if defined in the formal test bench, that can take any value based on its data type, of course. So here, if we say that D1 and D2 are uh, capital D1 and capital D2, uh, these are some symbolic variables which can take any possible value that the FIFO can store, then we will be catching any bugs for different D1 and D2 combinations. In fact, any D1 and D2 combinations as well. To make this work, we need to make sure that D1 and D2 should stay stable. Why? Because if uh, D1 takes one particular value when it's sampled in, and the value of D1 changes, then uh, when the original D1 comes out, we would expect this to get assigned, get asserted, but then it wouldn't because this capital D1, this has changed. So in short, um, if we are taking any symbolic value, in, not any, in this case at least, uh, we would want to keep D1 and D2 to be stable throughout the formal run. So uh, this, is, this is a tricky area. When we say stable, what all we are saying is in a particular formal run, D1 and D2 should, D1's value should stay stable and independently D2's value should stay stable like uh, like we are seeing here. But in a, in a separate formal run, it's free to take any other combination of D1 and D2. If there is any bug for any particular combination of D1 and D2, the formal tools are smart enough to figure out assign these D1 and D2 values to the symbolic D1 and D2, and then give you a counter example, which is the term for failure trace, so that you can debug that failure. Now, there are a few more catches. If you implement this check, there is a chance that you would, you would actually you would get a failure uh, if D1 and D2 turns out to be the same. Also, there's another case if what if d2 goes in before d1 
So you need to prevent those scenarios as well. So these are those uh, two additional assumptions that you want to keep along with the stability assumption that we discussed. Now, is that everything? Uh, wait, let's say uh, formal found out all combination of D1s and D2s and the check this check never failed. And let's say D1 is 1 and D2 is 2. I'm just taking some random values for 1, D1 and D2. And for the first time, this combination comes. D1 gets in, D2 gets in, D1 goes out, D2 goes out. It's fine. But, the, but after some clock cycles, the same scenario repeats. So in that case, this check will not catch it. How do we make sure that we catch those scenarios as well? So to ensure this case, ensure that we catch those bugs as well, we can introduce something uh, called maybe sample me or some other uh, symbolic variable. By that, what I mean is a free running signal. It can take any value, zero or one. It's a single, single bit signal. So maybe for the first occur, if there was a bug and the second occurrence of D1 and D2 combination, then for the first time, this will not be set high. So D1 can go in, D2 can go in, our check will not be activated, sample me will be zero, D1 in will be zero, and all these things doesn't matter. For the second time D1 goes in, this can just randomly go high, right? And the D in equal D1 would be high for first case also, but this was not high. For the second case, this would be high. Then this check will be activated for the second time D1 gets in, and then D2 gets in later. Is that everything? So we, uh, these checks, the checks that we, we discussed, you can catch data duplication, data loss, data reordering, but what if the data never comes out? Do you think this check would catch liveness? Something to think about. Meanwhile, don't forget to check out other formal verification videos from my channel, Formal Intelligence. Thanks a lot for watching this video. More exciting videos in the future sessions. Bye now.